For those of you that this is the first uh, lecture, let me just tell you, my name is Nick Leon. I'm the director of Design London. And Design London was set up following the Cox Review, Creativity in Business, that said there was a dramatic need for us to stir together different disciplines, increase the transfer of knowledge, interchange, and improve the way people were able to communicate across those disciplines in order to drive high performance innovation in the UK. Now, to, tonight's stir lecture is all about bio-nanotechnology and how infinitesimal changes, the kind of obviously the nanoscale, the maximum scale, in the field of properties, can transform <coughs> cities, the clothes we wear, the rooms we live in, the vehicles we drive in. So the design opportunities that are not on some far off horizon, but are here right now and in coming years. This is what we're going to share with you tonight. The first of our speakers is Gordon Clark. <coughs> Gordon Clark is from the National Physical Laboratory. Now, they've been innovating, and Gordon's area is particularly interesting because those of you, again, who were here last time, you know, are, are interested in using new technologies for visualization and for knowledge transfer. They are working on programs about nanotechnology and its implications and are using Second Life as the vehicle for that. So Gordon is going to share that with us and show a short film which includes that. Now to bio nanotechnology itself. Imperial College is recognized as the world leader in bio nanotechnology. We have a phenomenal incubator in the Bessemer building on this side, which is a, really a crucible of innovation and has some of the leading new firms, new ventures that are exploiting these technologies in dramatic ways. And the leader of this global leading organization is Professor Tony Katz. So Tony is going to take us through what nanotechnology means, what some of its implications are. And for you as designers, I'm keen, and how many designers or design students we have here in the audience tonight? Oh, loads! Fantastic. So, we're going to challenge you with thinking as well about how you can exploit these capabilities. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, very nice to be here with you this evening. As Nick has already told you, I'm from the, the National Physical Laboratory. Um, I'm part of the, the new media group, and we're looking at technologies not just like Second Life, but also um, uh, Wikipedias and, and blogging and uh, other uh, web-based technologies, such as YouTube, for, for sharing uh, the knowledge that we have uh, we have this concept called knowledge transfer that we think is very important. We've got lots of knowledge stored up in the brains of those 600 scientists, but they're not awfully good at getting it out uh, and letting other people know about it. And that, that's what our job is. And this is one of the ways that we're doing, that we're doing this through Second Life. Uh, and I'm going to spend about 10 minutes just now, which is a very short period of time. Uh, and this will really be a, a whistle-stop tour through what Second Life can do and also what we're doing to promote nanotechnology uh, through this medium. So about Second Life itself, um, it's run by a company called Linden Labs, uh, based in the States, and it is a, it's a virtual world. It's a world that exists in real time, so 24 hours a day you can go in and you're in a, a real immersive environment uh, that's three-dimensional. You can move around, much like, a, like any sort of basic computer game, really, uh, and you interact with other people. When you see another avatar, as they're called, when you see another person walking towards you, that is another real person. It's never a robot, it's never a computer. Behind that, uh, behind that avatar, no matter how strange it looks, and believe me, there are some very strange looking avatars out there, there is always another real person with whom you can engage and talk. The other thing to remember about Second Life is that Linden Labs owns Second Life and it owns the computers that Second Life is, is running on, but all the content is completely user-generated. 
everything you can see, from the buildings to the furniture to the animals to the, the plants, everything within Second Life has been created by another user within Second Life. And that ability to create content is very, very important within Second Life. But the key thing about Second Life, as far as I'm concerned, is the social interaction. That ability to meet with other people, one-on-one, -on -one, in groups, wherever they are around the world, and interact with them through voice, through text chat. It's, it's, it's a really wonderful way of, of meeting other people. Yes, thank, 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 thank you very much, Nick. Um, so when Nick asked me to give this talk, I was, I was a little bit um, uh, uncertain because although much of my research involves working with nanomaterials and devices, particularly in the context of, of healthcare delivery, um, talking more generally about nanotechnology can, can be quite a, a, a challenge, particularly if you've got about half an hour to do it in. So, so what I'm going to give you is a very... Um, superficial in many ways views of nanotechnology, putting my prejudices on display and, and hoping just to, to whet your appetite uh, uh, for, for what this science and this technology can do, which is really about engineering materials and devices, I've said on a small scale, on, on a very small scale. So, so on a macroscopic scale, we maybe build things over four orders of magnitude. If we go down in size, we can build things over seven orders of magnitude. So there's much more scope for manipulating materials, generating structures, generating devices below the scale that we're all familiar with of centimetres. There's a, a company, Nano Silver Clothing, um, which produces articles of clothing impregnated with nanoparticles of silver, uh, which is an antibacterial agent, so you can wear your underwear for a week uh, and, and still sit next to people on the tube without them moving away from you. So this idea of, of nanotechnology and nanotech has, has made it into the public consciousness in a big way, and it's considered new and, and whizzy. So, so the upper limit, if you like, of what we consider to be nanoscale science, nanotechnology, is the size of an, a single influenza virus. And if we go down another factor of 10 in size, we come down to these protein amyloid fibrils, which are produced in diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So this is what nature can do. What we can do is actually make things on comparable size, uh, comparable scales to what biology can deliver. Why, why is this length scale interesting? What is it about the sub-100 nanometer length scale that's attracted so much excitement. Well, if we can make the length, the size of our materials, the size of our devices, match certain physical phenomena, then we get properties that are quite unexpected. So here's a nanomaterial, very small in diameter, just a few atoms in diameter, that has a tensile strength greater than steel and a weight that's only a fraction that that of steel. One of the early suggestions was that, and there's lots of questions about manufacturing this on a large scale with the right properties, but if you could do that, what was suggested was you could actually use it uh, as a space elevator. That is because it's incredibly light and incredibly strong, if you could string it between the moon and the earth, it would be able to support the weight of uh, a space station. And so you would move materials essentially like a lift, but instead of using steel hawsers, which would break under their own weight if they were this long, you can use carbon nanofibers. Another example is we're on an environmental at slant. A small UK company, Oxonica, produced another material. In this case, it was another oxide of, of, of a different metal, cerium oxide, that makes diesel engines burn more cleanly. A few percent of this nano structured uh, cerium oxide mixed in with diesel fuel gives both better fuel efficiency and also a cleaner burn of those engines. 